In this video, I'm gonna talk about my experience with week three for Write for Life by Julia Cameron. Hey there, it's Christine, welcome to my YouTube channel. I am excited to share week three with you because if you are watching my um, mini series about Write for Life um, and the process of this six week program that is based on the artist way, yeah, the artist way by Julia Cameron and doing morning pages and all that. Um, Last week, in week two, I was just like feeling very depressed and it was bringing up all kinds of like, you know, things I couldn't necessarily identify. Um, so I've just been like following the program and, um, you know, pushing through the feelings, letting, allowing them, letting them come, all that stuff, and just continuing on with the tasks that she has outlined. Um, if you want to go back and watch, I think week one, I do a little more explaining about what is in the program. But um, in this uh, video, I'm going to talk about the kind of things that she discusses in week three. You know, it's funny. I, it, it feels like I've been doing this longer than two weeks because I just read the chapter about week three this morning. And I sort of feel like I already completed week three, but I haven't. <laughs> Um, so we're all, I've only completed literally two weeks of writing daily morning pages and, um, I can report in that, uh, I, I was feeling more, um, creative this week and clear. One of the things that she talks about in week three is just writing for clarity and not necessarily emotional clarity where, while that is true, but more, she she talks a lot about writing clear instead of trying to be good, which I always talk about. But um, let me just update you on the progress that I made. So I did do all days of the morning pages this week. So last week I had missed a day, which really wasn't that big of a deal to be honest, but, um, but I really tried to complete at least just the three pages of morning pages. Um, and just a refresher, so I am using this book, which is the Sacred Earth Journal. It's a blue angel journal, and it is by the same authors that created the Sacred Oracle deck. Um, so Tony Carmine Salerno, Lee, Leela J. Williams, and the artwork is Helena Nelson Reed. Um, so what I would do for my morning pages, since I wanted to make them a little more, not strategic, but just ha like have a topic to jump off, like a prompt. Um, so I would pull a card from the Sacred Earth Oracle, and that was a great way to go because, well, for one thing, I just, this the artwork in this deck is stunning. And each image, um, there is something to fall into, to grab onto. And so I, I've been really enjoying just using this deck, pulling a card a day and just thinking about the keyword and looking at the artwork and kind of just engaging with it. Um, it's been a really positive aspect of doing these pages. So, um, and then working in the journal, Again, like you're gonna see like little snippets of the art and different elements of poetry and things throughout. So like not every page, but a lot of the pages has a, like a little quote or a blurb and, um, and you know, the artwork is kind of um, spread throughout the book. And I've just been really enjoying that aspect of it. Um, it's felt really nurturing and special to, to use this journal. Um, so, you know, I've been writing just my pages and, and uh, one thing I started doing, which I think I did, but I can't remember. Um, I started writing down the time that I was doing my pages. So in doing so, like sometimes I wouldn't do my pages until like four o'clock in the afternoon, which is a little bit defeating the purpose of it. Um, but I started writing down the time and I noticed when I started doing that, it, I, I would do it earlier. So maybe do with that what you will. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so anyways, th those things have been going really successful, um, successfully. And the artist date, mm, it wasn't like intentional this week. Like I didn't, last week I... I took myself to the Mockingbird Moon store and kind of looked around and that's actually where I got this journal and or whenever that was. It was my first artist date. Um, yeah, so, oh gosh, it feels like I should be doing this for longer, but it's really only two weeks. So the, the artist date this week, I didn't have like that type of date that, uh, you know, engages like my imagination and my soul and stuff because I had like, um, like a pedicure appointment. 
I haven't had a pedicure in a really long time because I just like, I, I don't typically enjoy pedicures. So it's like one of those things like going to the dentist where I just like will avoid it if I can. But um, I decided like I met this woman who works at one of the salons nearby and she, you know, very gentle. So I decided to give it a try. So I, I wouldn't qualify that technically as my artist date, but it was a nurturing thing to do. And, um, it did sort of take up all the time that I had this week to choose like an extracurricular thing, like outside of my house, you know, because I, I here's the thing with writing is just, it takes so much time, like nothing gobbles time like writing because it isn't just drafting like words on a page you're thinking in between and you're getting ready to 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 access that part of your um soul and psychology and um you know creative well uh, before you really sit down so it's there's a lot of like process oriented things that happen there's a writer who i i am on her mailing list and um, her name is Elena Johnson and she writes, she's a super prolific writer um, and she puts out a lot of like, um, oh gosh, I want to say she, at least a book a month. Like she is a beast. And, but one of the things that she has taught herself to do is to write in 10 minute intervals. Like she has kids and is like busy and whatever, like got to go pick up her kids from school and that kind of thing. So she has taught herself anytime she has five minutes, 10 minutes to just write and I'm in awe, I stand her, I think that that's incredible and what a skill to be able to teach yourself to just like get it done. Um, but I I'm not that way, like if anything, I have to just slow down and um, you know, anytime I am elevated or just buzzy, I can't have a very hard time uh, focusing, concentrating. And it's not that I'm trying to infuse my writing practice with like reverence or make or wait for the muse or make it special. I'm, not, I'm trying to make it a habit. I'm trying to make it routine. But in that, um, if I get too um, elevated, I can't do it. So <laughs> maybe that's just something I need to work through. Anyway, we all have our process and um, mine is like, it just takes a long time. And so I, when I can um, find a half hour, an hour, or even two hours to sit down and write, that's ideal. Um, so, so I would say the the pages went well this week. The artist date was kind of like mm, I, I wouldn't say it was like I, I, I'm not going to give myself a check for that just because <laughs> I, I didn't do anything intentional. But I did do the walking, so that was good. Um, and then I did one of the exercises that she recommended. So some of the things that she would, just to recap last week, um, some of the tasks were just 20 minutes, kind of that Pomodoro method. And I have that one down. Like I, I am not afraid to approach the page for 20 minutes. Like I can get that done. Um, perfectionism. Yes. So I did that. That was the exercise that I did. Let me see if I can find my, it was kind of embarrassing though. Like what I remember when I was writing, my, you know, the sentence that you're supposed to work with is if I didn't have to do it perfectly, I'd dot, dot, dot. And I remember when I was writing my list, I was like, this is like a really embarrassing list. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm going to read it. Let me see. I'll read it. And then if there's something like hideous, I'll, I'll probably skip it. But here's what I wrote. If I didn't have to do it perfectly, I would write more books create more, say what's on my mind, leave the house without makeup. <laughs> That's probably one of the embarrassing ones. Embrace the messy side of myself. Talk to more people. That one I'm not sure I would do um, because I, when I had my dog and we would go for walks, daily walks, she was old. And so we would go super slow and she just liked to smell everything. And so people would inevitably come up to me and like, we would have chit chat and whatever, but um, it, I found it to be pretty depleting. But what I think I meant by that was not necessarily go up to people and have a conversation. I think it, I think it just meant engage with the people deeply that I already know and just that I care about that sort of thing. Um, 
I wrote to be more vulnerable about not knowing. So one of the things, and in fact, the advice piece of the 54321 tarot tag that we recently did, my piece of ad advice was to approach things with a beginner's mind, like um, you don't know, because even things that you already feel like you know, there's always somewhere to go. I really take this approach with like vocabulary words because sometimes I'll use a word and I'll be using it and maybe even I'll be using it in the right way. But if somebody asked me to define it, I would just be like, well, I don't know. <laughs> so and I think there's a lot of things like that where we just feel like we know them, but do we? You know, so that, that beginner's mind um, kind of like absolves the, the need to know, you know, that egoic response. But I will say that as women, we are enculturated where people talk over us, people interrupt us, um, people, you know, oftentimes we have to really fight to be heard. I don't always say what is on my mind. And sometimes like even in conversation, um, if you're the listener, if you're somebody that is typically the listener, the deep listener, you will never get a word in edgewise because people, if they feel any kind of awkward, will fill the space, right? So, um, so maybe there for me to write that, I, you know, if I didn't have to do it perfectly, I would talk to people more. Um, just meant like make the space, right? Um, oh, sorry, we were on, we were on be more vulnerable about not knowing. Oh my God, tangents are like my life, you guys. So anyway, um, but yes, so that beginner's mind, just being comfortable with not anticipating what you're going to say in a conversation and letting somebody say what they want to say, um, listening, giving people space, like that sort of thing. Um, okay, uh, if I didn't have to to do it perfectly, I would, and this is the one that like had a lot of like, mm, like a lot of um, emotional charge to it. And it was do my finances. So uh, yeah, uh, I, I will say like, that one has an emotional charge on it because uh, whenever I was growing up and my parents like, they were divorced, but if ever between the two of them, like my dad was really irresponsible with money. Like he actually made money, but he was very irresponsible with it. So, you know, I think he was always behind the gun and owing and things like that. And then my mom was the opposite with her money. Um, and she was very secretive. So I never really had a healthy role model for money. And then I was broke, like my twenties, my thirties, and my four, like I was broke for three decades, right? So, so money always has had a very painful charge to it. I always felt like I was doing it wrong or um, embarrassed to ask questions about it. And now that I'm in my 50s and my husband kind of came from the same place that I did about money, um, we force ourselves to talk about it because we have to, you know, you have, once you reach a certain age, the things that it's so important to be financially healthy and it's also an element of sobriety. Um, and I mean that in the sense where, um, more in an Al-Anon sense, but it absolutely applies if you have other addiction issues as well. Um, so any kind of unclarity about something that is so essential as money um, is, is, is critical to face the discomfort, right? So that is something that I have to work on on a daily basis. And I remember like taking a class um, and it really demystified a lot of the um, shame that I was experiencing around money. Uh, so when I took this class, I realized that everybody, most people have this type of shame. Um, and so just, just being willing to be uncomfortable around it was something that really helped me. Um, and so I think I still have, I'm still working through the shame of, um, my feelings and emotions around money. What, like a side note, one of the things that you learn when you're getting, um, education about money management is that, um, it's not emotional, it's numbers, right? So by taking, diffusing that emotional charge, um, it, it just really, really helps me. Um, okay, I wrote, uh, write my stories, teach more courses, share my ideas, which I'm I'm not, I, I share my ideas pretty fluidly here on YouTube. 
um, travel, stand up for myself more, go slow and be gentle, admit that happiness is sometimes hard. <laughs> that was my list. I don't know why I thought that was so embarrassing, but it's not that bad. <laughs> anyway, so that was a good exercise for me to do. And then another exercise that she had was uh, addressing the inner critic, like giving it a name. And that was something that I sort of did back in the day. And so I've always had, you know, a relation. I, I, let me, let me just put it this way. I did the inner critic work. I still have the inner critic. Um, but I took a lot of time before 10 years ago when I was trying to really delve into my writing journey and, and just like kind of own my creative journey. Um, I, I did that work about the inner critic. And if you are really interested in a great inner critic book, um, that book, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, um, is excellent because she uses a phrase in that book or like a, I'll paraphrase. It's like your inner critic is there to keep you safe, right? So you don't um, do anything that's going to wound your psychic soul, right? But, um, and she is allowed to come on the road trip, but she's not allowed to touch the radio. And that's pretty much like what I've got going with my inner critic. So she doesn't have a name, but um, I always think about that. She's here and it, the more that I listen to her in terms of what do you need versus believing the lies, um, I'm able to kind of function with my inner critics. So that's, that hasn't really been a big problem lately. Um, so moving into week three, there has been some really powerful um, things that I wanted to share about what's in, in the book in week three. And one of them is, one cool thing that she does in this book is she labels all like she, there's a there's a the, each chapter is broken up by the week and then each week has a variety of subheaders. The subheaders are honesty, vulnerability, anxiety, rhyming as a technique, jealousy, humility, patience, and so on. So, um, and then she writes a little blurb kind of about each concept as it pertains to writing and your writing practice and what's interesting is those types of keywords go really well with this deck too just like side note um so one of the things that she talks about in in terms of honesty is whenever you're trying to be like smart or good or or just look intelligent on the page like it doesn't go right because the best kind of writing is from the heart it's when you're completely yourself with all your flaws and and she explains that writing takes courage but especially because when you're writing what's true to you um, even if it's embarrassing or even if it's like you know shameful or whatever the feelings that come up those are the things that people are going to relate to and whenever you write to teach or to demonstrate or you know like when you're trying to give advice that sort of thing it never goes well and and I think trying to seem like super smart is one of those things and and uh, that was kind of the point she made it's better to be um, coming from your truth and putting those things those things, those thoughts, that heart on the page that it is to try to like craft, you know what I mean? And I, I absolutely agree with her there. Um, something she wrote in the vulnerability section, when our writing feels dull and flat, it's because we're refusing to say something we consider unsayable. We are refusing to be vulnerable, to share our secret heart. And I love that idea of having a secret heart because that means that there's something kind of in that core that we're trying to protect, that it has vulnerability and value to us, um, but it feels we feel like a baby bird when we want to share that. I find that to be really true when I'm writing fiction because I started my journey with fiction not having very much confidence at all. Um, and just kind of in sheer grit, I've earned a little bit of confidence. Um, but I've noticed like when I try to be like a writer or a romance writer, my when I go back and I read my pages, they feel flat, like they look flat, they feel flat. And it's like, I start to get bored writing them, you know? And whenever you start to get bored as a writer, I promise you, everybody says this because it's true and that is nobody, everybody else will be bored too. Um, so there, oh gosh, I wish I could remember 
who it was, but she was saying like, I only write scenes that I really want to write. And I thought, wow, okay, that, that's if you're a puzzler or a quilter or an intuitive writer, that is such a great approach because that means that you're writing all the scenes that you intuitively feel in your heart. Um, and then you might have to go back and try to connect scenes that are going to make sense. But um, I, I thought that was a really interesting approach to that idea of writing honesty and vulnerability. She also talks about um, anxiety and how that's kind of linked to this exercise about rhyming, which didn't really land that heavily with me because yes, I have anxiety, but um, I, I just, I feel like I've lived with my anxiety for so long now. It feels like a companion versus something that I'm fighting against. I know her, you know what I mean? I know who she is. And then there was this like sort of poetic uh, rhyming exercise, which I don't know, it just didn't really, I guess I shouldn't be so skeptical about it. I should try it, but I don't feel like it. And so I kind of, that part didn't really land. Um, but what did land, and this is something that I love as a tool, and that is jealousy, uh, because there is something um, in, in your soul. When you have a jealous feeling, there's something in your soul that's immediately identifying something that you want. And what better tool could there be than having that feeling and identifying it instantly? Ah, oh, there's something here I want. Um, and so again, that was kind of when I was doing um, the work of um, my inner critic, that was something that came up as well. So I, I do occasionally have jealous feelings and I welcome them because that means, oh, because like when you're um, raised in a toxic and narcissistic family system, what your needs are and what your wants are, are, are inconsequential. They don't matter and nobody reflects those to you. So you grow up with a very, um, like a very unsure sense of who you even are. And it takes a long time to figure that out. Like that authentic piece of your soul who is brave enough to admit they want things. So whenever I feel that, like even just the smallest pang, I am so grateful because I'm like, ah, okay, there's something I want. Yay. <laughs> so I've learned to use it as a tool and it is a great tool. And she kind of backs that up. She says, it's jealousy is a map. It tells us with excruciating precision, just where and for what we yearn. And I love that. So the mistake, of course, is believing the feeling of jealousy, like in terms of maybe acting acting it out, like using it for something other than a tool. I don't necessarily think that um, jealousy is one of the one of the few sort of dark emotions that you can have like control over, right? So, <laughs> so I think it's just, I, I really like it. I really use it a lot. Okay. So humility is another one. And I wrote, and I highlighted when we're willing to write from a spirit of service, our writing becomes more clear, more persuasive, more honest. Um, and that one really, that line really landed because, oh, there was something else. There was something else I wanted to share, but I can't find it. But, um, so that idea of service really landed with me because I think of it like this. Um, I think it's tempting when you're a creative person to get down on yourself because you think that like when you put yourself out there and put your work out there that there should be some kind of nameless faceless many that should be accepting of you and like see seeing what you do and just you know it's almost like a phantom famous kind of feeling where you're just like oh I don't know maybe it's like a craving for validation I'm not really sure but that, that whatever that mood is where you're putting yourself out there and nobody engages with what you're sharing um it's it's making it so what you share, you're, you're creating, craving validation instead of being of service. I think of being of service through creativity like if I were going to share an idea with somebody that I loved, how would I express it? How, how, what would be different about it? And um, my writing, I, I really use that kind of filter a lot because um, when I start to write for the nameless, faceless many, it always is terrible. Like it falls into that like egoic uh, territory where it's just like, um, you know, isn't my writing so florid, right? So um, when I do it, like I'm writing to my best friend or somebody that I know 
it's always better because it just feels more honest. So I think of that in terms of being of service, being um, open hearted and, and writing your truth, but also um, in the spirit of connecting to somebody else rather than teaching somebody else. I hope that makes sense. I love this too. Writing benefits from clarity and clarity comes from humility. Stripped of ego, our writing becomes accessible, heartfelt. There are so many like great one-liners in this, especially in week three. Um, so another um, thing that she talked about that kind of landed with me was this idea of discipline. And I've taught myself to be disciplined, but I still have a ways to go. Um, so I, I do write every day, every day, but I don't always write on my project every day. So because I'm in an MFA program, sometimes I have to write about books or, um, you know, different, different things like, uh, critique groups and there's all kinds of things you have to write, but um, so I don't necessarily get to my project every day because there's so many different facets of writing that you have to do. Um, so though I do write every day, um, I would like to be more disciplined about writing on my project, which doesn't always happen because at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. And, and I've always been somebody that's like, if there's something that I really need to do or that I really care about, I'll do everything else first, you know, and then eventually get to the thing. That, and, and that's not a good approach because the things, all those other little things, they will be there, you know, and the thing that's most important is the thing you should start with. So I've had to like, kind of try to make an adjustment in my mind, like the things that are most important are the top priority. So there's plenty more in week three, but um, those are some of the, the, the highlights that I wanted to go over. And um, so the tasks for week three, in addition to the morning pages and the artist date and the walking. Um, okay, so asking for guidance. Um, so I love this because um, it's tapping into the intuition. It's tapping into the creative well and asking your soul deep self what to do about different things or asking them questions. And, and so I love that idea of nurturing that skill. So, um, and then the other thing is jealousy. Uh, she says, a question. Make a list of everyone you are jealous of. Next to their name, write what you are jealous of. That's going to be juicy. Okay, so that one. And then trusting our ideas. Um, so there was a little blurb in, in, in um, the beginning of the chapter, just kind of about how a lot of writers who even have like multi-published books, they often hit a, a wall because they're like, oh, I don't know if that idea is any good. But ideas are neutral, right? And they are, uh, the more that you work with them and massage them and you see if they have like the longevity of their potential basically versus judging it as good or bad, right? So that that was good. Um, and then uh, she talks a lot about synchronicity. Like if you kind of put it out there to the world, like I would like to write a book and then you talk about it that, wow, weird, just this opportunity came to mind. And, and that's not the type of synchronicity that I believe in. I, I believe that exists. But um, in the same way that luck is one of those things like, you know how they say the, the, the harder you work, the luckier you are. Um, I hate that too, but but the, the underlying point is good. It's like the more you put your time, resources, and attention to something you care about, the more likely it is to flourish and the more um, skilled you will be. So it's like wherever you put your attention and love and care, those are the, those are the, the seeds of, that are in your garden that will grow, right? So in terms of synchronicity, like it's kind of like this. It's like, you don't ever think about a yellow Volkswagen, but as soon as I say it, all of a sudden you'll start to see a few, right? So that's kind of synchronicity. So when you, when it's on your radar, it's something that you've thought about and cultivated, the more likely you are to notice it and to have it be in your level of awareness. So that's kind of how I think of synchronicity. Um, and then there's another thing about writing to metabolize your life, um, just kind of processing through whatever is going on for you. And that is a sure thing. So even if you don't um, ever want to do a creative project in terms of your writing, if you just use writing for journaling and metabolizing life, you are golden. Like that is such a good, important skill and thing to do to nurture yourself, especially your creative spirit. It's amazing. So that was week three. I hope that you enjoyed uh, where this is going. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the video and where this is going. Um, so now again, this is six weeks. 
Yeah, so this is six weeks. So after this week, we will be halfway through. And um, yeah, so far I'm, I'm really enjoying this process. It's actually helping me in so many ways. And um, yeah, so there it is, Right for Life. Um, I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you guys next week. Bye.